Rahman Rahim. My name is Janine Hamam, and I live in um, London, Ontario. And I am married and have five children, alhamdulillah. Um, I have been Muslim now for about 22 years. I came from a Christian family, a very, very wonderful, wonderful family. Um, I met my husband when I was 17, and I married shortly after when I was 18. And um, alhamdulillah, we've been happy ever since. And I'm, every day I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for blessing me with, with the gift of Islam and the gift of the Ahlul Bayt. Alhamdulillah, when I uh, was engaged with my husband, he was still teaching me about Islam. So he would go to the, the Husseiniyah around, around where he lived, and then he would come to my house after and tell me everything, because all the, all the like, lectures were in Arabic, so he would come and explain to me about Islam, and I, I realized what a beautiful religion it was. Like, it was so pure, and it, it, wasn't, it wasn't complicated. Um, so, of course, when he explained to me about Islam, he explained about the Ahl al-Bayt. He taught me about Imam Hussein salam. He would go to Muharram, the Muharram program, and then he would come and tell me all about it in his own way. And then I, I was very touched about um, the stories that he told me. Alhamdulillah, when I got married, I also did the Shahada. I became Muslim, and I was very happy and very excited. And um, there was a very little unit that the, the brothers and sisters in the community rented out. So I would go there and then all my, my husband's friends' wives would explain to me what's going on because <clears throat> everything was in Arabic. So I was just learning Arabic in those days. Alhamdulillah, now I speak Arabic, but um, I didn't understand anything basically. But Alhamdulillah, with the support of the sisters, sometimes I would whisper to them and, and I would say, what is he saying now? And they would, you know, explain to me what's going on. So, alhamdulillah, like I understood, but it didn't really deeply like get into my soul at that time in my life. I was very young, and I, I think because it was in Arabic, I didn't understand. Like really, it was into, it was later on that I really understood more about um, about the Ahl al-Bayt. Alhamdulillah, my parents were very supportive <coughs> because. They love the akhlaq of my husband. And this is the main thing that we have to focus on as Muslims, our akhlaq. When we have good akhlaq, then people will, will want to speak with us and want to learn from us. So because he was such a polite and wonderful person, my parents felt that I would be in good hands with him. And that's why they accepted that I would marry him and become Muslim. I think definitely anyone who change, changes their religion, there's going to be challenges. Um, I think the main, main thing is just the ignorance of the society. Like, unfortunately, so many people don't really know the pure Islam. They only base their knowledge on what's in the media. So, of course, my parents were a little bit worried in the beginning. You know, as someone from a different country, my husband is from Lebanon, different country, different culture, different language, different religion. It's a lot to deal with with your 18-year-old daughter who you love so much and, and cherish so much. It's not easy. And I really, I pray every day for my parents for the support that they gave me. Alhamdulillah. So um, challenges, I think like, you know, just different things, understanding about tahara, understanding about you know, I can't, I can't, you know, drink or, or, you know, eat this kind of meat. And, you know, those little things, household things, um, are a little difficult. And I think also the hijab was difficult for them to understand. Uh, I think nowadays, this is 22 years later, alhamdulillah, in the Canadian society, you see so many more people wearing hijab, so many more Muslims. But at that time, it wasn't that popular. So um, I think that was a little bit a little bit difficult for them and it was also difficult when my daughter she was nine and she wanted to wear the hijab I think it was difficult for them but um, then they when they realized it was really her that wanted to wear the hijab and and now that they they realize how successful she has been in her life and how it's been a good thing for her I think they alhamdulillah they they understand now and they have respect for it my first experience well, like I mentioned before, I used to go to the, the little center and then um, uh, the ladies there would tell me kind of what's going on and everything. It didn't really give 
a big impact on me in those days. I do have a little, a, a little funny anecdote. I did go to a different center once. We wanted to try a different uh, a center. So I wasn't used to the whole thing of ladies on one side, men on the other. So my husband kind of dropped me at the door and said, okay, you'll be okay. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I went inside and there was, everyone was wearing, mashallah, big black uh, chadors. And I wasn't used to that. But I, 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 I didn't, like, it wasn't a big problem for me because I was always very open to different cultures. And, and I liked the fact that everybody was all, you know, together and sitting very humbly and listening to the lecture, even though I didn't understand. Um, Alhamdulillah, I always had a very good feeling. I was very, I always felt very welcome in all the centers that I attended. Alhamdulillah. In those days, because the, the language was a problem, what I would do is, what I would do was remember what the stories that my husband told me, and then I would kind of, if I could understand a name, like if I could hear them say the word Hussein, then I would start thinking about Imam Hussein and, and what happened to him. Especially, I remember, I knew the, the main story that stuck out in my mind, even though it wasn't directly connected with Karbala, I kept thinking about Sayyidah Fatima, and she was such a role model for me. So whenever the ladies would start crying, I would just start crying and thinking about Sayyidah Fatima, and what happened to her, and how she was oppressed. So that, that, made, you know, that made me emotional, and, and start to, to cry like the other ladies. But it wasn't until... Um, Later on, um, about 13 years ago, when we moved to London, um, I had a neighbor, and she was kind of wondering if we were Shia or, so, you know, or maybe another school of thought. And then when I told her my kids' names, she, she's thinking, okay, I think, I think this, this family is Shia. So I think she asked me, I said, yes, yes, we're Shia. She said, okay, alhamdulillah, I have to tell you about this place. Um, it's the mosque, and we do English lectures. We had, we had already been going to a, an Arabic mosque. And when I heard that, when I heard that there would be lectures in English, I was so excited. So she took me, and um, I went to all the programs. They had, like, all different fun programs, and, um, like, for all the different walada and wafats. And I remember my first Muharram feeling so emotional that now all these stories had come to life and now I could really feel and really cry from my heart for all the stories about, about Imam Hussein and Sayyidah Zainab and, and all, the, all the people who suffered in Karbala. So that was, I think, a big thing for me, being able to listen to the lectures in English. And that's when it really, really started to make an impact on me and in my life. Being brought up in a in a Western society, you don't really have that that atmosphere very often that you're sitting with people crying all around you. I had never had that in my life. Um, I think that's what I always loved about the Eastern culture. Also, that they're very warm, they're very hospitable, they're very emotional, and I was exposed to that in high school with my friends. I had some friends from the Middle East, uh, even way before I met my husband. So I always loved that that kind of that, uh, you know, the, the family gatherings. And so when everyone was crying, I could feel the pain. I could feel the emotion. So that's why it was easy for me to cry. And I just kept thinking, holding on to that thought about Sayyidah Fatima and the way, the way they treated her. I thought about, you know, losing her baby and how they could do that to the, 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 the daughter of the Prophet. So it was very easy for me, very easy for me. I did take my mother once to a wafat. I think it was wafat of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq And she was very touched. It was also an English lecture. And she felt it was very spiritual. And everyone in the mosque was so, so nice to her. And uh, alhamdulillah, like, I, I've always worried because I know Westerners are not used to seeing a lot of people wearing black. You know, I think it bothers them. It, it's, it's foreign to them. They don't, you know, they don't understand. Even funerals, my parents, they don't wear black. So to, to have everybody in the mosque wearing black, I think it would be a little bit much, much for them. But I, I do remember that my mom felt very, very at home because everyone was so nice to her. And I think that's very important for people to remember that if they do have guests coming to their mosque, or their centers, that they should be very kind, because it's the akhlaq, it's the akhlaq. This is the main reason that the Prophet came, came to, to us, to improve the akhlaq of people. 
So we have to remember this. It, the way we, we act in the mosque and out of the mosque, it's, it's a very um, important, important thing. If you have good akhlaq, if you're very welcoming and kind, just like the Prophet was and the Ahl al-Bayt was, then you attract people. You attract people to Islam and then inshallah they will, they will know the truth, the real people who we are, not what they read in the news. Last year we did um, a Who is Hussein campaign. We did our own little one here in London. Alhamdulillah, we had about 50 people from our mosque participate. So we had flags and we, we didn't do really a, pr a procession. What we did was we went to the main park in our, in our downtown and we had uh, tables set up with bookmarks and pamphlets. And we just had like a few volunteers stand at those tables. And then as people were walking by, we would just tell them, tell them little things like, have you heard of Imam Hussein? And just friendly, in a friendly way, give out a pamphlet. And we also had water bottles uh, that had labels on them, just saying a quote from Imam Hussein, just to bring awareness. Um, it went well. People were very, you know, I even had this one man come up to me and said, oh, are you taking donations? Do you, do you need money for something? I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> we're, we're giving to you. We're giving you this water in the name of Imam Hussein. Oh, who's that? You know, so it, was, it, it went well. I think for next year, inshallah, First of all, it was rainy. It was really rainy. So inshallah, next year, we'll pray for some sunshine and get more people passing by. Um, I think one mistake we made was we did have flags that were in English with some quotes from, from uh, Western philosophers, Gandhi, you know, different people that people could connect with. I think we did have a lot of flags that were written in Arabic. I think maybe that was... Um, a mistake because most of the people in that park were all like Canadian, Canadian English speaking, so they wouldn't understand what the, the the flags said. So I think for us, maybe in other other countries, it would work really well. If there was maybe a big Arabic speaking community, it would work well. But for us, I think maybe just to stick with the English would be would be better next time. But Alhamdulillah, it went well. Alhamdulillah, as as principal of our madrasa here in London. Uh, I think the first year I, I said we have to do a play because when I was a teenager I used to act and, and do things like that. So I thought I, I better bring my old skills into an Islamic way and um, have the kids, you know, do a, a, do a play about Imam Hussein. And um, it was really, really time consuming to prepare. I had the kids come over and practice their lines and I had all the costumes ready and everything. So it was really fun and creative, um, but it also, the main purpose of it was that so all the madrasa children could actually see what happened in Karbala, rather than just going to the Husseini and listening to the lecture, seeing everyone wearing black. I wanted them to really know what happened. So what we did was um, we wrote our, our own play, and we just kind of began at the story when Imam Hussein, Imam Hussein leaves the Hajj, and then his journey and then what happens in Karbala and um, all the different sad stories that happen, Habib ibn Mudahir and Ali Akbar and, and Qasim and all, all the stories so that the children are performing and, and they're feeling like what, what it would be like to be Qasim right now. What, it would, be, what would it feel like to be, to be the, the Layla, you know, the mother of, uh, of you know, Ali Akbar and the mother of Ali Azhar. And so... Um, and at the end, you know, of course, I was backstage and like, you know, yelling at the kids, come back here and put your costume with this. It was very hectic and very crazy. But when it was over, I actually had parents in tears. And because the last scene, the last scene of the play was when Imam Zain Labadin is in his chains and walking, walking to Sham um, with Sayyidah Zainab and all the children are behind them. So... So when they, um, when they came up to me, I said, Alhamdulillah, you know, they said, sister, we felt that we were there. We really felt that we were there with Imam Hussein. And Alhamdulillah, like I had no idea that people would actually really, you know, would, would really like the play that much. Like I was very happy that despite the technical difficulties or, you know, like, Alhamdulillah, it made the impact that we, we were hoping for. And the children, they learned a lot. And, and I really encourage 
doing more activity-based based learning. And that's what I'm trying to promote also in our madrasa, you know, doing plays and doing activities, inshallah, to teach them, to teach them more about the Ahlul Bayt and make it, make it more fun for them. I would say just like, I mean, if we can celebrate our birthday every year and if we can celebrate our country's birthday every year and, and all different holidays every year, why wouldn't we celebrate the most important, one of the most important days that ever happened in the history of the world? A day where someone stood up to oppression, a day where, where he gave up everything, everything, his family, his life, for the name of Islam, for us, for us to be better Muslims. I would say once a year is not enough. I would say every day, every day is Ashura, and every land is Karbala. Um, just like they have Remembrance Day and, and, you know, like any other holiday once a year, I think it's very important because it's not just a regular battle. It wasn't a battle about power or, or you know, it was, it was a battle. What can I say about Karbala? There's so many lessons to be learned in this day. So, of course, we need to remember it every year. SubhanAllah, Allah, He made the calendar, like, perfect for us. Because I think we get so busy with this dunya. We get so busy with our school and our work and, and our shopping and all of these things. So then we have Ramadan and we're fasting and we're getting spiritual. We're going to the Husseini. We're, we're you know, doing all the amal and everything. And then when it's over, we, we feel refreshed. We feel like a new person. And then as the month, two months, three months, they go by, you start to get back into that dunya and that routine and everything. Alhamdulillah, this is our life. Alhamdulillah. But then, then it's time for Muharram. And I think it's a time that is so special because this is the time for my family, like, we know that it's Muharram. Every night we're going to the Husseiniya together. We're going to listen to the lecture. We're excited who's the speaker going to be. Is he going to be good? Is he going to tell us stories? Are we going to learn something? So I think it's such a special, special time that we're really committed. We're, you know, we're not thinking about, you know, material things. We're not thinking about, you know, watching movies and, and doing things like that. We're really focusing on Allah and the Ahlul Bayt and we're thinking about Imam Hussein. We're thinking about Sayyida Zainab. But every day we're thinking of a different person that, that you know, in, in the story of Karbala. So it's a very, very spiritual time. Um, not only at night when we go to the Husseiniyah, there's majalis and uh, going to people's houses. It's, it's, it's such a, it's like, it's a spiritual, I think I've heard Ramadan being called a spiritual banquet for the soul. And so is Ashura, definitely, because we learn so much about ourselves and we learn, we learn so much um, from, from the characters, like from the people in, in the story of Karbala that we try to implement in our own lives. Sayyida Zainab, uh, she's very special to me because she's the only member of the Ahlul Bayt I've had the, the pleasure and the blessing to visit, inshallah, alhamdulillah, in Syria. And... Um, just, she's such a role model for, for women in Islam to stand up for your rights. And this is something that we need to do in this day and age because there's so much oppression and there's so much, you know, so much negative things being said about women in Islam. And then you have this amazing role model like Sayyida Zainab. Um, if people knew more about her, all Muslims and non-Muslims, and, and they would see how she stood up so many years ago in front of everyone, you know, for her rights, then maybe they would understand Islam more. So she's very special to me. The first time I visited her, these were the days when I hadn't heard English lectures. So, you know, I did a ziyara and it was very lovely and everything, but I didn't really feel like, I didn't really know her. But then years later, I was blessed to go back and then it really hit me like, here I am, Sayyida Zainab, here I am, I'm here again to visit you. And I just cried so much. I cried so much to, to visit Sayyida Zainab. And um, it made a real, real impact on me. And I remember the second, the, that, that time that I went, it was so crowded. There were so many people. And I saw these old ladies. I remember there was a very old lady who could hardly walk. 
and I was I was helping her to reach the the dari, and I just started crying. Like, look at all these people coming to visit Sayyida Zainab. You know, young and old and sick and healthy and all different people coming to visit her. This one lady, this lady in Islam. Alhamdulillah. The really sad story that I always remember is that you know in the in the lectures sometimes you know the the speakers have such a way to to really trigger that that emotion so one that really stands out is that they say that Sayyida Zainab salamu alayha she didn't cry she didn't cry when her children were were killed but she cried when she came back to Medina and and her children weren't there anymore and their beds were empty so that that story really really like it touches me a lot because I can't imagine coming back home to an empty house and all your children are gone. I think no matter what we do, no matter how much money we donate, how many, how many you know, things we do to help our community, it could never be and never nowhere near what Imam Hussein did for us. If it wasn't for Imam Hussein saving the true and pure Islam, we wouldn't be here today. What, what would have happened to us? as a ummah, what would have happened to us? So the very least we can do is help our community, attend majalis, uh, donate in the name of Hussein, whether it is to Ahl Bayt TV, whether it is to uh, different centers, whether it is donating blood in the name of Hussein. N not everything is money, of course. You can donate your time. You can um, help in the madaris, and you can help and volunteer. You can do all of these things, you know, to please Allah and then in the name of Hussein or in the name of Sayyidah Zainab. So no matter what we do, it will never come close to, to what they did for us. I think it is our duty as Muslims to read the news every day and know what's going on around the world. Um, if you see what's going on, the oppression, the, you know, it's just like the time of Imam Hussein. It's just like 1400 years ago. History is constantly repeating itself. People are being beheaded, people are being killed, people are being, uh, you know, they're, they're starving. So we have to connect with them. If, if we are supposed to be, you know, good Muslims, if we are a good Muslim, then it is our duty to read and to know what's going on in the world. Just because we live in the West doesn't mean that we just go on with our comfortable lives. Um, we have to think and feel with them and help them, you know, whether it is writing an article or, or you know, donating money or, you know, just spreading knowledge. Unfortunately, not all the media says everything that's true. You know, some things, some people don't have any clue what's going on in the Middle East. You know, they'll only hear certain stories, one-sided stories. So as Muslims, maybe the very least that we can do is educate ourselves uh, you know, gain knowledge from different different um, sources of media, and then educate our neighbors, our friends at work, and tell them really what's going on, so that they will know. So, definitely, there is oppression. Um, I think more than ever right now, if we see what's going on around the world, um, there is so much oppression now, and I think just by speaking about it and standing up for it and defending the people who are being oppressed, um, helping with whether it is by time or, or, or donating or volunteering or whatever that, you know, whatever we can do, even though we are so far away and read and, and praying for them, of course, even just remembering them in our duas, inshallah, we, we just pray. I think the main thing we really have to do is pray for our imam. You know, my daughter was just telling me today that about 20 million go and visit Imam Hussein every year, if not more. And we can't even, you know, we don't even have 313 to support our Imam. This is so sad. This is so sad. So because we just pray, we pray. If, if we do have these 313 leaders and, and good Muslims to follow, then inshallah, oppression will end. And that's what we pray for, inshallah. I think every, every week, the least that we can do is, um, is remember our Imam, because there's a connection, of course. If we're remembering Imam Mahdi, Ajat al Faraj al Sharif, then we're remembering Imam Hussein, we're remembering Imam Ali, we're remembering all the, all the Imams 
every day of our life. So we can make connection with them by reading different du'as, like we can read in the morning before, uh, after Fajr, du'a al-Ahad, to remember Imam Mahdi. And especially, especially the, the line in du'a Nadba. Alhamdulillah, we have a little group of ladies who are committed to coming on Friday mornings to read du'a Nadba for the Imam. And the line that always makes our tears come down is, Aina al-Hasan, Aina al-Hussein, Aina abna al-Hussein. So when we remember this in our du'a, then we think about how sad, like, what happened to Imam Hussein? What happened to Imam Hassan? What happened to all the Imams? It's just unbelievable if you think about how amazing these people were, that these, these perfect people who had the most pristine akhlaq, the most incredible generosity and patience and knowledge were oppressed and, and were, were killed and poisoned. and It's just unbelievable. So if we think about that every day, then we have to kind of put in our minds that if they went through all of this, then what can we do to kind of follow and, and respect their name, like kind of remember them? Just being good Muslims, having good akhlaq, helping people, helping the community, donating, doing all of these things, just little things every day then maybe we can be just a little bit like them.